Our affirmative debater is a clinical psychologist and professor at the University of Central Oklahoma. Don't hold that against him. <laughs> there are many, many nice Oklahomans, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, somewhere. The author or editor of six books, over 50 scientific publications, and hundreds of national and international presentations, he specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and teaching critical thinking. He is also the director of Secular Therapy Project. Hey, I just got louder and that was cool. <laughs> the Secular Therapy... <laughs> Now I'm really loud. Therapy Project, an international database connecting people who are seeking mental health services with secular evidence-based clinicians. Please welcome Dr. Caleb Lack to the stage. Our opposing debater has been involved in commercial real estate development, CEO of a national entertainment company, executive pastor at Riverbend Church, and executive director of several nonprofits. Today, he is a spiritual advisor and coach to leaders all over the globe, whose primary mission is to move the world beyond religions to connections. Most of his life, Mike has pursued, pers not talking well today, doesn't bode well for the rest of the day. Mike has pursued freedom for all, internal freedom. And since being introduced to the 12 steps in 1992, he has worked them, taught, and led hundreds of people across the country how to and live them in his life. Please welcome Mr. Mike Reinhardt to the stage. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome to the debate. You will proceed as follows. Three minutes each for an opening statement, then three minutes for a rebuttal, each time beginning with the affirmative debater. Then you will have a chance to interrogate, I mean question one another. You will have one minute to respond to each question. Then we will take some questions from the audience, again with one minute response times. We will complete the debate with your closing statements of three minutes each, beginning with our opposing debater. There are a few rules. Obey your time limits. I will warn, oops. I will warn you with a ping when time is up. You may finish your sentence, because I am benevolent, <laughs> but I will begin lurking in a menacing fashion if you don't do so quickly. No hitting below the belt, figuratively or literally, and address all of your comments to me, your moderatrix. And so we begin. Dr. Lack? Thank you all for having me down here, even though I'm Oklahoma. <laughs> um, Alcohol and, uh, alcoholic Anonymous and other 12-step groups are one of the oldest and most popular methods of treatment for addiction. AA and its sister groups are based around a fellowship of individuals helping each other through their substance use problems. Their 12-step recovery method has become deeply ingrained in society as the key method for treating addiction over the past 80 years. The effectiveness of this program is so widely accepted that many courts mandate people who have things like DUIs uh, attend AA meetings. Unfortunately, these 12-step programs are founded on shaky science and anecdotal evidence, not a solid evidence base. The founding principles of AA are religious in nature. For instance, seven of the 12 steps reference God or Him. While AA today claims to be ag agnostic, saying it does not require religious faith to work, this is in direct conflict with its founding principles that refer to God or one's relationship with God as central to recovery. Recovery based on religious principles and prayers may be and is important for some, uh, but it could simultaneously be a detriment to a non-religious person. In fact, one survey showed that over two-thirds of former AA members disliked the religious aspects, and over half found it to be the least helpful aspect of the program. Moreover, research has shown that the religious and spiritual aspects of AA are not what causes change for the minority of people who do in fact change. Instead, the reason why AA works for anyone is due to the development of a healthier social network, increased self-efficacy, and increased coping skills. These features are not unique to AA and are consistently found in effective mutual self-help groups such as smart recovery or moderation management. Another perhaps more damning flaw of these programs is that they do not seem to work for most people based on all available data. According to the AA Triennial Survey, 76% of their membership has been sober for over a year. 
However, research on AA from people outside of the organization shows a very different success rate, somewhere between 5 to 20 percent. For a hard to treat behavioral problem, this still sounds good until you realize that what we call spontaneous recovery or the getting better with no intervention happens in about 25% of individuals with an alcohol abuse problem in any given year. This type of regression to the mean is rarely accounted for in the pro-AA literature, uh, but it's crucial in examining whether treatment is truly effective. A final problem with the AA or the 12-step model is that it demands complete and total abstinence of drinking from its participants. This is in sharp contrast to decades of available research showing that substantial portions of once problematic drinkers are actually able to consume alcohol in moderation with no resulting functional impairment. Well, that is a really bright light. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, one of the things that came up for me as I got up here was the, in the words of the immortal Ann Richards, you know, that dog just won't hunt. Uh, you know, the realities are that AA and the 12 steps, and, and AA is, is kind of synonymous with 12 steps, but the realities are, I think there's something like 279 different kinds of 12-step groups out there. So it's not just about alcohol, that's just where it kind of began. The, the thing about uh, AA and the 12 steps is that so much of the, what the founders of AA said has actually been proven out in modern research, particularly when you get into the doctor's opinion. You know, modern research and brain studies and everything else has actually proven up a lot of what was written back in the 1930s before there was anything remotely close to research. The, uh, the power and the validity of the 12 steps today or just like in, in Michael's presentation about exercise, the effectiveness of exercise has actually been there forever. You know, and so many of the exercises we do in modern times actually mirrored movements that we made when we did work and things in, in ancient times. And, and AA is, or the 12 steps are like that as well. They are based on ancient principles that were brought into existence at a time when if you were an addict of any kind, you were hopeless. You were typically sent off to an insane asylum or somewhere else where they, nobody knew how to deal with you. And, and there's also this big giant distinction between, uh, <coughs> be, be, between people that are actually addicted and people that just drink too much. <laughs> And there are plenty of both, but the 12 steps and the spirituality of 12 steps, you know, in the, in the original 12 step books, they talked about that alcohol was but a symptom. That the real disease was a spiritual disease. And it was that spiritual solution that actually brought about the recovery. And I think, is that me? My time is up? Not just yet. Oh. 30 seconds. oh, okay. I was looking at the clock and it looked really bad. <laughs> yeah, so, so, it, so it really is. Just like everything else, we learn things all along the way. And the founding principles of the 12 steps, the concepts of the 12 steps, the habit of the 12 steps is just as appropriate and applicable today as it ever was. Thank you. of excellent timekeepers here. I have not yet had to deploy my moderatorial wine glass. <laughs> I'm just over there drinking out of it. <laughs> well, we have a couple of bold arguments ably stated, and I'm hoping we can get into some more of the meat of them coming up. Dr. Luck? All right, so um, <clears throat> just kind of rebutting a couple of Mike's open statements, or opening sort of statements. Um, when he mentioned that, you know, there's 279 plus programs, uh, the thing is they're all coming from the same principles. 
And these same principles, which were in most part sort of first formulated by an evangelical pastor named Frank Buckman as part of the Oxford group, um, they all started the same, and they all have at their base the same sort of principles that we actually now know aren't what actually causes the change in AA or NA or Gamblers Anonymous or anything like that. Um, so I'd say that, you know, despite the fact that there's lots of those different kinds of programs, I don't know that that has anything to do with their effectiveness. Um, I would also say that, you know, you know Mike mentioned that a, a lot of modern research sort of is showing and proving that uh, the words of Bill W. and Dr. Bob and folks like that early in the movement uh, were accurate. I'd say that's not actually accurate at all. For example, uh, Dr. Bob referred to alcohol as being an allergen, um, and we know that, that is completely inaccurate. And we know that instead, modern neurological, neuroscience, and behavioral research all shows that that's not how addiction works, and that and people are not addicts forever, as you would have, for example, uh, some sort of severe allergy forever. Um, so I would say that those points are not necessarily accurate based on modern scientific research. And then, you know, he makes a, a sort of distinction between what we would call an addict versus a problematic drinker. That's also not something that we distinguish between in modern science and modern research. Uh, diagnostically, we have what's called substance use disorder, um, as opposed to saying that, well, if you just drink too much, it's not a problem, but if you're an addict, it's something else. No, in terms of what we have are levels of functional impairment that are based on consumption of substances that, for some people, is problematic. Uh, but I don't think a lot of the things that really the 12 steps started with, which are really what they're continuing with now, some 80 plus years later, haven't been in any way borne out by modern research. You know, you know it, it is interesting that uh, there's so much disagreement about research. You know, we happen to be sitting here in the home of uh, a little college called the University of Texas, which in the College of Natural Science has one of the largest brain collections in the world. Uh, and they are actually constantly uh, analyzing those brains and doing research. And they have completely created that addiction really is a disease that lives right in here where these two fingers uh, intersect. And it is a genetic makeup that causes actual addiction. The, uh, and there's all kinds of definitions of addictions and everything else. But what I really want to get to is that the, uh, the numbers are there. That people using the 12 steps have a spiritual experience and they do recover as a result of that spiritual experience. In the early days of the 12 steps, uh, when, the, when, the, when the steps were really worked rigorously, 67% of the people that worked the steps in the way in which they were prescribed never drank again. Uh, and we don't have those kinds of results in basically, I don't think, in any major illness today. The thing is that the, the 12 steps do actually work. And yeah, there's all those benefits as well of, you know, better communities, you know, better people to hang out with, different habits. But it's about creating new habits that actually have you live life differently. And yes, they, they, they did come from the Buckman and the uh, Oxford group and stuff like that, but the steps can be traced back into ancient times uh, in many different sources to actually come to the same steps that Bill W. and Dr. Bob broke down into 12. They are relevant, they do work, are they the only way that people get sober? Heck no. But they work, and they work for many millions of people walking around in this country today.
guys are keeping me on my toes, man. I can't even sit down. So we have reached the interrogatory part of the evening. We will begin with each of our debaters asking a question of the other. Just for pure logistical sense, I'm going to step to the side and not keep going up and down the stairs. So it'll be a little crowded on stage, but we will get through it just fine. <clears throat> we will begin with Dr. Lax. Question for Mr. Reinhardt. Okay. Uh, so in a number of ways, AA has many of the hallmarks that experts use to define a cult. It's a social group, sorry. It's a social group defined by its interest in a particular goal, not drinking. It also displays um, authoritarian leadership and rules, exclusivism, isolationism, groupthink, and so on. These can be seen in the push for things like 90 meetings in 90 days, adherence to a very strict set of rules, obeying teaching from a specific book, blaming the individual as weak if they don't quote unquote work the system, uh, being told it's okay to neglect your family for the program, being told that if you're struggling it's because you've gotten in the way of God's will, uh, and questioning that the program uh, is seen as a sign of weakness or that you're being problematic. So my question is, how do you respond to people who argue that 12-step programs treat a person's addiction to alcohol or other substances by merely replacing it with membership in a cult-like environment, therefore becoming addicted to the 12-step program? Yeah, it's really, it, it really is interesting. We use that word cult-like in so many different cases. Uh, and, you know, we could even argue that the P90X or whatever program, well, that's a cult. You know, and that's becoming a cult, maybe even more so, because it's more about worshiping one man. You know, the thing, and I've heard all those things before. Uh, and uh, the thing about it, I haven't had that experience in any of the 12-step meetings that I've been in. And I've been in hundreds of them all over the country. Uh, and you know there are some things about habits. You know if you want to if you want to break a habit, you got to replace it with something else. And so going to meeting ninety meetings in ninety days breaks you out of the habit of going to ninety bars in ninety days. Uh, and, and there are some things about it. I've never heard anybody talk about you know ignoring your family. In fact, what you're really doing in the twelve steps is you're becoming present with your family in a way you have never been able to. We could, you get all of the other stuff out of the way. Time, sir. And please remain there for your question for Dr. Lack. Yes, uh, uh, my question is, is, you know, in the types of programs that you may be proposing, particularly we talked about the abstinence-based programs and other things like that, how do they work better for people who are just abusers or over drinkers or over addicts or are they work better for people who are actually addicted to the point that they can't stop even in the face of serious uh, outcomes how many of us fall off the stage tonight? Um, so great, great question. So basically, uh, who do the programs that I'm proposing as evidence-based programs work for? Uh, and the answer is everybody. Um, the programs that I'm talking about, what they do is they focus on increasing your own self-efficacy, increasing your coping, teaching you how to operate in new environments and change your environment in various ways. They don't have to work for somebody who is, um, you know, what you might define as a, a true addict versus just a problematic drinker, which again, I think is a nonsense distinction because um, it's just a matter of continuum. So everyone drinks problematically at some point if they're a drinker, um, maybe they get drunk, does that mean that they're problematic or they're an addict? There's no real distinction. Um, so the, the answer is these questions work for everyone. And it doesn't matter if you are Religious, non-religious, um, if you have various kinds of addiction, uh, we have great evidence-based programs that work for much, much more of the population than we see things like AA work for. Um, and sort of, I think that says that we should use those instead of the others.
Now we come to you getting to play a part. So we will have uh, questions from the audience. We will begin with a question for our affirmative debater and then a question for our opposing debater and alternate as so as for as many questions as we have time for. I will warn you, we are looking for questions, not manifestos, polemics, <laughs> dissertations, or personal statements of worth and being. So with that said, I will begin with a question for our affirmative debater. First hand right there. You claim that you have evidence-based results, but your opponent also claims to have evidence, and he's quoting percentages and numbers. Why is your data collection to be believed it is not to be believed? You claim that you have evidence. He claims that he has evidence. Why are your data better than his data? So as a um, researcher who actually specializes in what we call pseudosciences, meaning things that act like science but aren't, this is a fantastic question. Um, because what we have on what I would call the evidence-based practice side is we have things like randomized, placebo-controlled, uh, double-blinded studies, which means that we're controlling for biases that researchers might have that um, might be due to changes that might be due to regression of the mean or the placebo effect or things like that. So the quality of the evidence is what's key. And in the sort of stuff that I'm talking about with, for example, smart recovery or cognitive behavioral therapy, what we see is we see the very, very high levels of evidence as opposed to I, who believe this, am the one who's doing the research. So therefore, surprisingly, I find things that agree with what I believe. Um, so that's why it's key to have organizations that are outside of, for example, the 12-step programs that conduct that research in order to see does it really work or not. Thank you. Now we have a question for our opposing. We have many hands up already. We'll start right here in the second row. Uh, in your opening statements, you described addiction as a spiritual disease, and then in your rebuttal, you switched it to a physiological disease. Which is it? You have described addiction as both a spiritual and physiological disease. Which is it? Well, my quick answer would be both. Uh, you know, and and the and part of that is the difference between in the early days, you know, they didn't have modern research; they had never seen inside a brain uh, and done all of that kind of stuff. What what they have, what we are seeing today, is that the spiritual solution is still the most effective way, the most significant way that people recover from addictions is the spiritual solution. And notice I keep using the word spiritual and not religious. If, if I could just follow up. There are no follow-ups, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Again, going to the question was, there are no follow-ups. <laughs> Madam Timekeeper, have we time for another round? All right. Who has a question for our affirmative debater? You know, the one way in the back went up first and is waving at me, so I'm, I'm inclined to believe this. Yes, you. So, um, the, uh, the data you, you reference suggests a lot of things, but what is the accessibility and the cost of evidence-based programs relative to 12-step? All right, what is the accessibility and cost of evidence-based programs refer compared to 12-step programs? Great question. Uh, the short answer is there's a heck of a lot more AA programs out there. Um, there's an increasing amount of things like smart recovery groups, moderation management, uh, secular, uh, SOS, save our sobriety. Um, and all of those tend to be actually no or low cost. Uh, there's an increasing amount of those that are out there. But as I'll talk about in a uh, minute in my closing statements, those tend to be best when paired with individualized evidence-based practice like motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, which can be delivered by typically masters or doctoral level psychologists um, or you know, counselors. Now cost-wise, that obviously costs much more than going to a free meeting you know, every day or whatever, because there's no cost there, uh, except in the cost of doing something that's not actually effective and wasting that time that you could be spending doing effective things that would allow you to actually change. 
And our final audience question, uh, first hand went up down here. How do you, how would you say that 12-step programs work for people who do not believe in a God, or who are not spiritual or religious? How can they work for people like that? How can 12-step programs work for people who are not spiritual or religious and who do not believe in a God? You know, it, it's actually a central point of 12 steps that you don't have to. You know, remember in the steps, if you read the steps, they say God as you understand God. And so you can like put in there whatever you want. What, what works about them is not that you begin to believe in God, that big guy with the white beard and white head, you know, and all that stuff, but that you actually believe that there is a power somewhere greater than yourself. And it's in surrendering to that, because what gets most of us really into addictions and things like that is actually we think we're bigger than everybody else. And that we're invincible, or literally like that, we're God. And so it's like surrendering to all of that that ultimately gets people recovery, even if they don't ever believe in God. So now we must bring the audience interrogatories to a close. However, I would advise any of you who still have questions to join our fine folks for the after show where they may be able to engage you in a little more direct conversation. What we come now to is the rebuttal phase and our opposing, I'm sorry, closing arguments. <sighs> Apologize. We come now to our closing arguments and our opposing debater will begin. The, uh, I think the actual statement was that 12-step uh, programs are obsolete. And, and I think that it's pretty clear from my perspective, obviously, that they are a long way from obsolete. Are they the end-all, cure-all? No. There are people that aren't ever going to do that. They're not ever going to get into a group and like really explain that. But the realities of it are that 12 steps actually work. And, you know, it's like Emmett Fox was one of the people who had a tremendous influence on the uh, creation and the writing and, and the structure of the 12 steps and everything, kind of from the sideline. But he, but he, and he had a definition, because religion seems to kind of keep coming up, but he had a re definition of religion that was the practice of the presence of God. And what the 12 steps do is they actually allow us to put our ego, our self aside, and get present to something bigger than ourselves. And in the process of that, we actually recover. Uh, and we become people that we actually want to be around. You know, some of the promises of the 12-step programs are things like that. You know, before we are finished with these process, you know, that fear of insecurity and economic insecurity and inferiority and things like that actually disappear. The 12 steps are incredibly relevant. They are powerful. They are simple. They are literally simple steps that actually take you through the process of surrendering to anything that's not working correctly in your life. And so I invite you to like really take on that. The 12 steps are a long way from obsolete. And Dr. Lack, your final statement. The takeaway from my side should not be that AA doesn't work for anyone. Although there are no clinical trials demonstrating that it is effective, the research does appear to show that AA-type groups work fairly well for a particular group of people, those that strongly identify with the spiritual concepts inherent in the program. However, the aspects of AA that appear to actually be the most helpful in reducing problematic drinking, improving coping skills, developing a supportive, non-drinking social network, improving one's self-efficacy, are common to many 
mutual self-help programs. Moreover, these types of mutual self-help programs seem to operate most effectively when paired with individualized evidence-based treatments for substance abuse. These include cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, relapse prevention, and even some types of medications that can be paired with therapy. But in attending a smart recovery, moderation management, HAMS, or life ring group, individuals will not be told that they are powerless, that they have no self-control, that they are deeply flawed. Instead, they learn new skills that allow them to increase their personal locus of control to show that they are the ones who can change rather than relying on some external force alone. There is also less chance of a major relapse than in 12-step programs, which show a high rate of binge drinking among users thanks to the doctrine of one drink, one drunk. So the takeaway I want you all to have from me is this. AA may work for a very particular group of people, certainly not everyone, but not because of something unique to it. Rather than using AA, other self-help groups that focus on improving control over yourself, modifying your environment, and teaching new coping skills should be combined with individualized evidence-based treatments. In doing so, we will be able to deliver the most effective treatment to people struggling with substance abuse and decrease the negative impacts on themselves and on society. Thank you. Love the Dionysians, we have reached the moment of truth. You are now deciding. If you do agree with the debate uh, resolution that 12-step programs are obsolete, please raise one and only one hand cheerfully skyward, and our maestro, Graham Reynolds, will count you. Oh. This is probably a good time to mention that we will be heading over, taking the party over to cover three, correct? We're trying out cover three this time. We'll see how it goes. So Buzz and LB will be back with some certainly very simple and uncomplicated directions in a little bit that no longer include go right past cover three. I'm not sure how that will work out. Okay? All right. If you do not agree with the resolution that 12-step programs are obsolete, now is the time to raise one and only one hand cheerfully skyward, and the maestro will count you all. I see you people whispering to each other out there. <laughs> Your own responses, people. <laughs> I would like to say that you are a delightful audience and you are currently in the running for one of my three favorite audiences. <laughs> but, you know, the competition there is pretty fierce. We have a lot of great audiences. What were the others? Well, I can't tell you that. You'll time travel and do something to them. I can't, I can't I, I'm sorry, I can't indulge this sort of jealousy. I will, however, say that they all had Leonard in them. <laughs> And our maestro has spoken, as have you. The resolution has passed. 12-step programs are obsolete. I would like to take a moment to thank both of our debaters. Please give them one rousing and Thank you for coming.